everybody. Hello. How are you going? Thank you for coming tonight. This is a very exciting event um, that we're hosting in partnership with Parramatta Riverside Theatre and Accessible Arts. My name is Riona and I just want to uh, do a brief introduction. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, um, any Aboriginal people that are here tonight. I'd like to acknowledge specifically the, the Darrow clan um, and elders that are here, past, present and future. I'd also like to acknowledge the deaf people here, your language, Auslan, your culture, and I'd like to thank you for coming along tonight. I'd like to now introduce Alex Jones. Alex is an actor, among other things, um, involved in the deaf community and the arts community for many years. And I'd also like to introduce Jody, who's an actor also and a creative. So I would like to metaphorically hand the microphone over to Alex and we'll get started for tonight. Thank you, Riona. So thank you for the introduction. As Riona mentioned, my name is Alex Jones and as you can see, tonight's, uh, tonight's interview is accessible. We want to make sure that uh, the captioners will be able to take in all the information and provide you with the captioning this evening. Later on this evening, we will also have a question and answer session at the end. So if you do have a question when it is question time, we ask you to please make your way down here to your left and just make a short queue. There is 10 minutes set aside for a question and answer session. So we will take it easy tonight just to ensure that it is accessible to everyone. I have been very privileged to be asked to come and have a conversation with Jody. It's really the couch conversation. <laughs> What's that? Yes, I've, I can see you've got, there's no alcohol, no booze here. Maybe the audience might have some. But let me just introduce Jody. Jody is the artistic director of Jody Mundy Collaborations. She works as a creative and experiential artist and her work is to challenge the perceptions from the audience. She has travelled the world, and I believe you've been to Indonesia. How many sign languages do you actually know, Jodi? I'd say three. Three? But really two, two fluently. So Jodi's work has actually been shown in Sydney twice. So her first show was Imagined Touch. And I will actually question her a little bit more about that later. Can I just ask from the audience, how many people actually attended Imagined Touch? So quite a few here. Wow. And, of course, we have Personal. Personal was actually here about a month ago at the Sydney Opera House. And fortunately here at Riverside Theatre, being shown tomorrow and through this weekend. So really, today's just a bit of an informal conversation. And I think I'm actually very privileged to be sitting in the seat that I am as a trained actor. And my, uh, my experience in experimental theatre, I actually really admire your work and the various mediums that's a part of your work. You've previously been involved in puppetry, and various other mediums, including film, imagery, sound. And it's really inspired me when I go and watch your work. I actually think it's incredible. With personal, what made you come up with the idea to share that story? What was the seed that planted it? Hmm. I remember in 2011, I went to an artist residency. So um, artists got together for a week away, a retreat, and we had to, you know, put our dreams and put together, um, really dedicate time to our dreams and our creativity. 
you had to stand up and present in front of the other creatives and in front of the group. And I presented everything, um, but I didn't mention anything about the deaf culture or my family. So I left that out. Right. And one person actually raised their hand and said, your art's okay, but your family, wow. Tell me everything. I want to know all about it. And I was like, oh, really? I've had enough of people asking about my family. Just give me a break. And, you know, I was a bit cranky. I went home. I got a bit upset. And because growing up, there was lots of questions. Um, Mum and Dad know that, who are here tonight. Lots of questions. Um, and it w it's quite a... And I looked at myself and said, why am I resisting this so much? And I really took the time to gain some insight. And I thought, you know, I would start drawing pictures, like a comic. Like once upon a time, a little girl, she had deaf parents. She had two brothers. And I kept drawing and drawing and drawing. And, and I had over 200 drawings in, a, in the space of one year. And I thought, wow, I have a story here. I showed my parents and I invited, um, uh, you know, some friends, very close friends, because this was very personal to me. It was a very personal story I was sharing with these people. And I thought, maybe I'll make a book, a children's book, you know, a, for a coda to read as they grow up. Okay, and sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Jodie, but just for some of our audience members who might not be familiar with that term, code, CODA, CODA refers to a child of a deaf adult who Jodie identifies herself. It means she comes from a family that is deaf. Thank you, Alex, thanks. So as I was drawing these comics and um, I, got, I got completely um, caught up in Imagine Touch uh, and the deafblind experience and the deafblind world, and... It all got put aside and then I thought, oh, I must get back to that. And then I kept getting caught up in other things. And Imagine Touch, I was completely um, caught up in that. And I had another residency, a writing residency. And I went off to the country for two weeks on my own in this little house. It was very scary, actually. Uh, every night I was like, oh, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> but, you know, during the day it was beautiful. There were cows and fields and... And, you know, I had the time to reflect on myself as a child and the emotions I felt as a child and the community and the privilege that I have to be part of the deaf world but also be part of the hearing world. I see so many of my friends um, emotionally struggle with fitting into those worlds um, but I was able to put it all down on paper and I kept writing and drawing and... At the same time, my parents um, had old movie reels. What was it? Do you remember? That they moved to DVD. Um, was that Super 8? Yes, yeah, Super 8. That's right. Yep. Just checking with mum. Yep. And they gifted me eight DVDs. I watched them at the same time. All while of I was them. in the country. Oh, it, was, it was so emotional. It was beautiful. Uh, you know, videos of mum and dad's wedding. Mum and dad are here. They're just in the sitting in the second row. Hello, mum and dad. Hello. <laughs> so Peter and Gillian. And beautiful films. Um, just amazing memories. And they would have that old um, vintage feel to them. They were silent. Um, there were the, the family growing up, sometimes deaf community events. And I thought, wow, this is special. And, you know, deaf people will really just be amazed to see this. Hearing people too. It's your average Australian family using Auslan. Going camping, you know, caravanning, fishing. All the different things I did growing up. Birthdays. Yes, birthdays. birthdays. And so I had all these drawings and these writings and the films and just really odd films from my childhood sometimes. And I looked at it and went, Wow. Oh, no, there's a show here. <laughs> no, there's a show. And I was thinking about the book and I was like, oh, this is going to be good. But I'm an actor. I'm a performer. I love to perform. I love to tell stories. And I realised that I had to face it and show myself. 
and step out into the light, I knew my story wasn't my own. It was many other people have experienced the same story. And I looked around and there's no other story like it out there. You know, in deaf theatre, it's not told. And I thought I, I need someone to take that step forward and be brave and tell the story. I talked to my parents, talked to my brothers, my niece and my nephew. I asked for permission. And I said, there's going to be a lot of promotion. I know I knew Imagine Touch, um, after Imagine Touch, that it would be well promoted. My family supported me. We had a discussion about it. We did videos. There were some things that they were a bit wary about. And I was a bit wary about And I realised... It's not only our family. There are so many families out there that have the same story and that it will help the awareness. So I guess that's, that's where it started, Alex. So I just want to talk a little bit more about the development process itself, but I want to go back to one point that you mentioned about deaf theatre and how rare it is in mainstream theatre. So here in Australia... I think there's several reasons why, whether it's numbers, whether it's training, and of course there's funding that's uh, that links to that. With the story of personal, I'm wondering if your show, you know, perhaps was pigeonholed, or whether you felt was it th that it fit in the deaf arts space, or how how did that fit in terms of mainstream theatre? That's a great question, Alex. Um, First, I want to say that you're actually one of my role models. ATOD, that's where I learnt theatre, Australian Theatre of the Deaf. Mum and Dad never went to mainstream theatre. I went to deaf theatre growing up. Australian Theatre of the Deaf is where my roots are. <laughs> and Alex was a big part of that. I would sit there in awe, or I'd go to Stanmore, the deaf club. Every Friday night, they would have crowds of people, and it was deaf club. They'd have a stage. Do you remember the stage? And every Friday night, people would get up and tell stories or deaf jokes. And I would get up too. I was so young. And I would just get up and tell my stories. And I loved being in front of people. It's where I loved performing. I loved to see people show their true colours and share their stories. And that's where you were bitten by the bug, so to speak. Yes. At Stanmore. It, you know, actors are, you know, famous for having the actor's bug. Often people ask actors when they were bitten. And for you, Jodie, was it Stanmore? And Australian Theatre of the Deaf. I remember you specifically. You came from America. Uh, and I was like, oh, there's theatre in America. Wow, deaf theatre. Oh, wow. And I was so excited. And I thought, well, <laughs> I'm hearing, really. But that question over where I fit... I, I'm constantly questioning that myself and I have been questioning myself all my life. Where, where do I fit in? At the moment, I'm trying to say it's Auslan Art, Auslan Theatre. And I say that because I think it's important that deaf people recognise our community is not only made up of deaf people. We have people that are deaf blind. We have coders. We have hearing people who learnt sign later in their life. I think it's really important to recognise and respect that we have diversity in our community as well. I understand there's a balance of power within the community um, about who can access the community more and that's a dynamic we need to respect. But we also need to respect our diversity within the community. So in terms of deaf theatre, I don't know. What do you think? I, I think art can't be pigeonholed, can't be put in a box if it's good. If it's good art, it can't be put in a box. What do you think? I agree. Yes, oh, that's, I, that's I the answer agree. I wanted I to hear. We're going to push the boundaries and yes, help definitely. us talk about what deaf theatre means, what is my theatre, what... What can I identify myself in, in our community? And I think that's what experiential theatre is. That's a, that's a part of that experience. Mm, yep. It's where you push the boundaries. 
And open your mind. Absolutely. Opening the minds of others. I've seen the show myself. Can I just check with the audience? Who's seen the show? So I can count two, but so, so not many people, here. Yep. Well, I've got them seeing it tomorrow night. Well, l- look, I don't want to spoil it for any audience members here. But I do want to add a little bit of a layer for the audience as an extra benefit for you, I suppose, prior, for you s- prior to you seeing the show. So I don't you feel like I'm giving you any spoilers or that you need to, to hide away. But what I really want to ask you about in terms of the show itself is you focused on providing providing an experience to the audience, whether they are deaf or whether they are hearing. And a few times you did, I guess, play with the black, the bad luck card in terms of what you performed and what you made accessible. I'm wondering what parts of the show you were more willing or daring to perform as opposed to other aspects perhaps you were a little bit more um, a little bit more safe. Hmm, safe, okay. Um, This show personal is a process for me. It's an emotional process. At the start of the performance, I thought everyone needs to be on an equal page. The show needs to be 100% accessible. It needs to be inclusive for everybody. Everyone needs to understand everything. I've got captions, I've got film, I've got everything. And then the team I worked with went, oh, well, yawn. And I was like, really? Why are you being so diplomatic? Why does it need to be equal for everyone? Conservative, yeah. Theatre has to have some sort of, we need to stir the pot somehow. We need we can't have the audience feeling so comfortable. We want them sitting there going, ooh, what's going on? And working it out. How can hearing people understand deaf people being excluded if they know everything for the, for the entire show, if they're fully included? So in some parts of the show I'm signing and it's not interpreted. <laughs> Bad luck. And that's unfortunately the same with the sound. Um, Sometimes deaf people know what the sound is, sometimes they don't. My brother Gavin, he worked on the, he was a translation consultant. Hold on, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you there. You mean you only had your family involved in the development stage? No one else? Oh no, there were artists as well. Right, okay. So we had uh, a sound design, uh, a set designer, a videographer, uh, choreography, director, writer, uh, so writing support for the script, um, sound support, and Gavin, my brother, who was the Auslan consultant. Gavin said, maybe you should put the sound in, like, in brackets, like it's on TV, like in, in captions, and I was, I thought, hmm, my team of artists, uh, the creative team, uh, they're very, they're mainstream. They, d- they don't have exposure to the deaf community. And they went, brackets? Oh, mm. And I was like, no, we have to. Because the community will get upset if, you know, we don't make it accessible. And they said to me, whose world is this? Who's your world? Personal's your world. It's not the deaf world. It's not the hearing world. It's your world. And sometimes I take a step out and I, you know, spend time in the hearing world. My parents don't know what I do in the hearing world. Or sometimes I spend time in the deaf deaf community where the hearing people don't know what I'm going to do. Personal's your show, your expression. It's not about the audience. This is about you and what you are expressing and your process and what you need to get out. They will work it out. It's only 50 minutes. They're not going to die if they don't know. And it's important for the audience to realise after they leave, inclusion means what exclusion means as well. They're one and the same. And a person who spends time in both worlds, 
that's what I go through. That's what personal is about. So at the start, I did really didn't want to, but my team pushed me. They really pushed me to think about the show as an expression of my art, not trying to please everybody all the time. And that's, you know, in this setting it's okay. Art, we're looking at something different. Okay. However, and, and look, I don't mean this in a negative way, but the people who appreciate the art in that context, your personal journey, are coders. <laughs> yeah. mm. Am I right? Yeah, very true. And, and that's okay. And I appreciated that. I thought it was a beautiful journey. And how you really unpacked that emotional journey and displayed that for everyone to see. But in terms of that process, was there a healing process in that for you as well? This is great therapy, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And it's cheap too. You don't actually need to go to a, a psychologist of any sorts yeah. to pay. I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> I think because growing up, um, many people questioned me so much or so often or the school teachers would put a camera in my face mm, and ask definitely. me questions. And you'll see that throughout the show. <laughs> you are as cute as a button. So my personal life was always public. It was never my own. If we were at a dinner party, you know, hearing people would be chatting along and they go, oh, did you know Jodie's parents are deaf and her actually her whole family's deaf? And I'm there in the middle of taking a mouthful and everyone's like, oh, wow, really? And then they've got 100 million questions for me. Or I'm at a party, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I've had maybe too much to drink, and people are like, wow! <laughs> it's never mine. It's always public. Because people are always interested. So I realised my personal story is I need to work out how to share that with the public. Because audiences who haven't got exposure to the deaf community don't know. And they don't know how life was like. Personal is not my story from beginning to end. It gives you a superficial look, just, just a touch at the surface. And there's, there's more information in articles and interviews that are out there if you Google things in, uh, in, in the deaf community. But there's things I need to resolve if you imagine, I'm 40 now. <laughs> oh, you certainly don't look it. You don't look it at all. Mm. A bit of nip-tuck here, that's all. <laughs> but no, no, I, I've had no work done. This is all real. <laughs> so 40 years. I was born in 1978. The year of uh, international disability um, was 1981. So... I look at how my family's life has changed in that 40 years. So looking at technology and the use of the phone, captioning, you know, on Neighbours and Home and Away. There wasn't captioning on the news and then it came along. Um, but it our world became more accessible. You know, when I was 14 or 15, there was we started using faxes and mum had a pager. We were able to then text. And then finally, we're, we're able to FaceTime. So looking at that spectrum from my relationship with my family and how we communicate and how their life's improved. My brother Shane, you know, completing his HSC. He was the first deaf person in New South Wales. And uh, along with David Parker. My, my parents fought for that. And then he went to university and they fought for that. I was there. I was a little girl at the time, you know, helping my parents where I could, interpreting where I could. So looking at that spectrum, I realised I needed to give the audience. I, I had an opportunity, a privilege to talk to the media and s share my story. You know, with I go on radio and I talk about this. 
And people are like, oh, the hearing community are like, wow, I didn't know. Oh, gosh, it's amazing. So for me, this show personal, I wanted to share with the public because my story was never personal. It's about our community, our society. It's about how we access, it's inclusion, it's about power, it's about oppression. So there's, there's so many themes within that. I'm just reflecting on everything that you've just said and personal being a journey of yours. I guess it's a little like an identity journey where you were able to find yourself. There's one part when you're telling your story, when you talk about your role as an interpreter. And I know many other interpreters who watch your show will appreciate that section just as much as coders appreciate your section as well because they can identify with that similarly. So you identify in your journey as being a coder and you actually found yourself as Jody. But I guess, I, you know, I'm not trying to pigeonhole you and put you into any <laughs> box. And as you can see here, there's a number of boxes, <laughs> at, which, you know, is a little symbolic. But as an interpreter myself, how old are you when you realise you are the interpreter in your family? Hmm. Do you know what I mean? So if you think of a closet, you have a wardrobe, you have a repertoire of attire and you pick a coat and you put it on and this particular coat is a coda coat and this particular coat is an interpreting coat. When do you actually realise that you take that coat off, off the coat hanger, you put it on and you've adopted that role as an interpreter? When I was small, I wanted to be an interpreter and an actor. Oh, really? <laughs> Who was your role model? Who was your interpreting role model? In Sydney? Mm, I was quite young. Uh, Della Goswell and Della Bampton, all coders. Um, and any interpreter that was a coder, I kind of worshipped them. It's the same as you, Alex, as an actor. I worshipped you. I remember I loved interpreting. I still love interpreting. It's something I, I love and it's something I appreciate and I love theatre in the same way. When I was young, I looked up to those people and I said, that will be my job one day. Or I looked up at Alex and, and I said, that will be my job. The, the coat and the, it's a symbol of the show about putting on an outfit and I, there's a part of the show where I take it off, <laughs> but I have to put it back on. I will always be an interpreter. I will never stop being an interpreter. I don't want to. But it's important also to show that sometimes there's moments of frustration where you want to take that coat off and sometimes you just have to suck it up and there's other times where you're happy to put it on. So, and I think that's with any job. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah. When I was young, I wasn't paid, obviously. <laughs> I, I, I think you've got some money owed to you, Jody. Oh, they fed me, they housed me, they clothed me. But I wasn't uh, frustrated that I had to interpret for family. I think I had to understand the biggest, the biggest scheme in things. The government weren't paying for interpreters. The university had no access. I didn't understand that at the time. And I was, because uh, at the time I was often questioning, why me? Because there weren't any that at the time. I think interpreters um, would only come and interpret for funerals or weddings. Hospital? Were there any interpreters there? Uh, I don't think so, no. Court, not at court either. So no court interpreters. No hospital interpreters, nothing. That was my job. And there's a lot of grief about that. I was small. But it's not my family's fault. It's the system. I mean, the system is improving slowly, 40 years in the making. And technology is improving as well. Mm -hmm. Awareness is increasing. There's now recognition. 
our awareness, our human rights. Leone, the amazing CEO of the Deaf Society. You know, we we've our roles are changing, our life is changing. We have more opportunities. It's been a team effort. Okay, so I'm now going to go back to the artistry. You're a wonderful artist within the community and those artists are limited. I'm wondering if it's opening avenues potentially for other deaf people to consider a role in the arts. Now you've had two quite large productions and I'm sure that there are some deaf artists in the audience. I'm wondering if you have any tips or ideas, you know, any secrets of the trade, I suppose, that you could provide any artists in the audience. For about 20 years, I was really passionate about supporting deaf art. I still am. Uh, you know, setting up the Deaf Art Network in Melbourne. I was 20 years old. And it's still going? Yes, it is still going. It's slightly smaller now. And why is that, do you think? As Melbourne, the city itself has become more inclusive. The organisations have become more inclusive. And you're starting to see a lot more deaf artists flourish in Melbourne. And that's taken 20 years for artists to become successful. You know, from the ground up. It's like an apprenticeship almost. A sculptor can't just sculpt. A painter can't just paint. There's work that goes into it before they're successful. I, th you know, I'm looking at 20 years of work. The deaf artists in Melbourne now are at 20, 30. You think of Anna Seymour, amazing dancer. You know, I, she will rise. She works hard. I'm her mentor. And Jess Moody. Jess Moody, yes. So she's in Deferent Theatre, and so I'm her mentor as well. Luke King. I'm his mentor also. And I always help with applications and we FaceTime often. And there's more of that pool growing. There will be a program starting in June. One Saturday every month. To, to teach. It will be in Auslan to teach Jeff and Coda and, you know, hearing people that use Auslan how to progress their art. This program is something I'll be facilitating in Melbourne. <laughs> and that's part of the secret. <laughs> but the secret really is to know how to write funding applications. If you want to be successful, if you want to be paid, you need to find the money and you need to know how to write an application. And English is the barrier. It's definitely, it's a, it's a significant barrier for many deaf people. You know, English is my second language. But the beautiful thing, we've got the NDIS now, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, that you're able to sign your application and pay an interpreter to translate that application. And, you know, just letting you know I'm happy to translate those applications. <laughs> I'm very good. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely, Jody. I agree. But not only that, it's to really give insight to yourself, to find out what will make impact. Okay, so can I ask you, sorry to interrupt you, Jody, but what's missing? So in hindsight, what's been missing in terms of deaf artistry? What, what has stopped deaf artists from succeeding? What do you think the biggest barriers are? So we talk about applications now. Do you think it's limited experience because of limited training or what do you think have been the significant barriers to date? So looking at Australian Theatre of the Deaf, that was magical, beautiful. And I think I, I remember speaking with you, um, Shakespeare, we w and that was in Auslan, that was, that was in Auslan, yes, that's right, yep. Um, and the theatre became more for children, more of a mime, became became more of a visual vernacular and wasn't as such a high um, – there wasn't any change, there wasn't any push to really stir the pot or to make impact or to make it look different. It became the same as everything else 
And then when it became the same as everything else, it lost its funding. Then deaf people didn't know how to write the applications and the money was gone and who could lead it? That's where it all fell apart. In Melbourne, you know, we set up um, Deaf Arts Network. Um, we had workshops. We tried to encourage it. It fell apart a few times, but Anna kept going. Luke kept going. There was only a few artists, but they're now flourishing. They're growing. And that's from their persistence. It takes years. And it's taken years for them to learn how to write applications. It takes time. They've got other jobs to pay the rent. It's not easy. It's, it's, re it's, just, it's really not easy. I can interpret. I can step out, earn an income in interpreting and come back to art. But Luke and Anna, finding a job that pays them to pay the rent to survive, that's, what, that's where you need to be crazy. <laughs> if you want to be a successful artist, you have to be slightly crazy. <laughs> You need to prepare to be very poor for a while. And that's, that's the truth. And learn how to write well. Have determination day and night. And finally, until you have that breakthrough, right it's a sweet <laughs> ride after that. Lovely it's lovely now. <laughs> yes, and you've had two fantastic productions. I know personal is personally about you, but imagine to touch had two deaf-blind artists present their own work. I know both of them are a little bit different, but I'm perhaps you can tell me what is different and perhaps what the similarities are between the two productions and what the journey has been like since the production of Imagine Touched to Personal. So if you think about the deaf community with the barriers that they experience and then think about the deaf-blind community and triple those barriers... Heather Lawson uh, was born deaf and has Usher syndrome, which means that she later became blind, and that's the condition of Usher's. So in her 20s... So I'm just going to interrupt you just for a little bit. Usher's syndrome has a little bit of a, a spectrum. Sometimes somebody with Usher's um, will slowly lose their peripheral vision and their vision may start to tunnel. They may actually see some spots in their vision. Yes, that's right. So there's actually a variety of the way people can see, or a variety of things that people can see or can't see if they have Usher's syndrome. A little bit like there's a spectrum of, of deafness in the level of deafness you have. The amount that you can actually see from your eyes actually varies with somebody who has Usher's syndrome. I just wanted to make that clear for the audience. So Heather, um, has lost her sight completely. She's an amazing woman. She advocates uh, and has been advocating for many years. She went to school in America. And then uh, the Helen Keller Institute is where she went. And she learned about how to navigate the world and human rights and advocacy. And she's truly an inspiration. And then there's Michelle Stevens. She was born blind and then lost her hearing. And she plays the piano and she's still an amazing pianist. And she fixes pianos. That's part of her job. She's a tuner. And when she lost her hearing, it was a big grieving process for her. She learnt to sign. She went to university at La Trobe and learnt tactile, hand over hand, sign language. Could you just explain a little bit more about how tactile works? Well, so I'm signing now, just to show you a visual example. We'll just demonstrate here. Pretend that I'm the person that's blind. Hello, how are you? And I can actually feel the movements of the sign it's to work to out what you. she's saying. And I'm glad to see you too. So there are some tweaks with some finger spelling, tactile finger spelling, uh, and you make communication changes depending on the person. But amazing. I learnt so much. Deafblind culture is so incredible. 
So Michelle as well um, is a strong advocate and worked with Heather. They approached me in 2012 and said, we want you. We want you to direct a show with us. And I went, oh. Uh. Inside I knew I've always dreamt of doing something in the deafblind theatre space. I think we have a family friend um, named Billy. I'm not sure if you remember Billy. Oh, amazing. He himself is an artist. And weaved baskets um, out made out of cane. And he would always come and visit out at our family home uh, growing up. I remember as a little girl, you know, communicating him, communicating with him using a really tactile method. And I would watch people... I, I was amazed on how he could talk to me or understand me and I just was overwhelmed by it. He would often touch my face. Um, as I got older, when I was 16, he would touch my face again and, and smell. You, you've been smoking. <laughs> and I was like, oh, um, uh, and he caught me and I was like, I, I've given up now. But when I was young, I used to smoke. It was the cool thing to do. I had a nose piercing and wore the boots and... And I was, oh, that was the last time I saw him. <laughs> he caught me out smoking. And since then, I've had Heather and Michelle approach me and they, they told me they want me to do a direct a show with them. And I thought, okay. I was working on other shows at the time and it was still in the back of my mind. And as time went on, I saw an application for the Australian Council Government So it was a development uh, for community, for minority communities. It was, a, it was a grant around minorities. And they wanted to develop and support and give them, uh, give identity a strong voice and access. That was my passion, of course. And I was like, this is made for me. <laughs> and so I filled out the application and sent it in. We waited patiently for three months. It failed. I was so angry. I was—I like, couldn't believe it, and then I realised the people who were reading the applications didn't know anything about deafblind people. I had to educate the funding people. Fair enough. Okay, so just to clarify, what happened? Did you make a complaint? Did you object? Well, no, you can't complain. You can just be angry about it. Um, I realised I needed to go in depth and explain to the people that decide the funding, the panel. They need to they know nothing about deafblind people. So I applied again. I fi filmed Heather and Michelle, showed had their communication, their tactile communication. And then in a thousand words, it was so limited, you had to keep it to a thousand words and explain to them, you know, we've got four interpreters, um, they need to swap um, to in order to facilitate communication. There was haptics. Uh, you know, all these workshops that we needed to do in order to make it successful, we sent it off, crossed everything, and it was successful. And we were all so excited. Uh, the funding came through for 12 months of funding. So once a month we would get, uh, do a workshop about storytelling. It was almost like a course. Uh, so that was the, the team. Um, so we did puppetry, mime, uh, you know, touching the, so sensory. Taxidermy, so dead animals, <laughs> touching and feeling those. Uh, we touched everything. <laughs> uh, there was dance and movement. Uh, we brainstormed ideas and that went on for one year. There was also a team filming, uh, making a documentary uh, and a researcher. So I made sure we had it was a once-off show, so I wanted to make sure it was fully supported. We didn't know if it would happen again. <laughs> it depends who was crazy enough to, to raise that type of money uh, for all to put that team back together. And who, fun who, who gathered all that money? It was over $500,000 and I worked on that for six years. Wow, incredible. Well done. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. Absolutely. That's definitely admirable. Thank you. And there were so many partnerships as well. And Leonie, who's here tonight, 
Um, the Deaf Society of New South Wales were really supportive. Accessible arts were amazing. When we came to Sydney Festival, the money came in from different organisations. Uh, arts Access Victoria, ABLE Australia. They helped because there was so much interpreting costs involved with the show, as I'm sure you can imagine. You know, we had... Um, four support workers, four interpreters. So when the interpreters were having a break, the support workers would come on. So it was a team of eight just to support two people. Um, and then we had six artists and then myself, the stage manager, and 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 there were so many people involved. You can imagine the cost of each of us. It's incredible. To all be involved in one theatre, you'd look at the cost of theatre, the lights, $100,000 for two weeks, and that was the team. And Heather and Michelle were paid also. We were all paid equally. Well, well, of course, you were all professionals. <laughs> so it was very big, right, Mum, Dad? <laughs> I, I almost had a mental breakdown. My parents were very worried about me for a while. It was such a big job, but so worthwhile. Because now we're going to London. <laughs> are, you going, are you going to London for a festival? Which festival? called the Spill Festival in London. Uh, it's in the it's a very famous centre in England called the Barbican Centre. And it's my favourite venue. It's similar to Sydney, like the Sydney Opera House that's quite famous. That's the same as the Barbican. It's a big centre in a biggest centre in Europe. And it's the biggest artist centre in Europe. So it's an amazing opportunity that we have to go over there. I can't say who's funded it, but we've just had the access cost for Heather, Michelle, the interpreters uh, to come from Australia. So that money's come through. We weren't sure if we could find the money, where we could find the money, whether we could get interpreters. Um, but we have found that money and we're still fundraising more. And Sophia, uh, she's doing a documentary. We're working together on that. So we're producing a documentary uh, and it's it's a collaboration of the work or collation of work from 2013 onwards. Uh, and so in 2020, we hope to release, hopefully on TV, a one-hour documentary um, to show how it started from day one and how we got to London. It shows our journey. Heather and Michelle are... I'm not sure how to say it. Just they're strong, strong... Sometimes when I'm feeling tired, I think of them. They give me strength because they're strong, strong women. It's funny. Well, not, not funny as such because they're sharing their personal journeys just as you are. And it is a personal journey. And I think that's what's admirable is that you collaborate to share a piece of work and you share your personal stories with the rest of the world. Hopefully, that just creates more opportunity in the future. But, unfortunately, we are slowly running out of time, and I do want to open up the floor to any audience members who might have some burning questions that they would like to ask you. And if you do, can I just ask for you to just come down here to your left, which is my right. Mum just said, um, Imagine Touch won an award. Tell them about that. And that was in 2016. Thank you, Mum. Yes. <laughs> yes, a round of applause. Well done. <laughs> yes. <coughs> and, and I hope that you do win many more awards. Look, I think awards are fantastic. I think it's fantastic recognition. But the work itself, if it changes the perspective of others... and it starts to open up people's mind about deaf blindness in Australia, especially with the NDIS. I hope that that provides opportunity to people, that they no longer have to hide, that they can actually be, be seen, and that the, the wider audience can actually see the communities as well, just as Imagine Touched has hopefully helped down break some of those barriers that this continues to be the outcome of that. Mm, I hope so. Beautiful, thank you. Perfect spot, Kate. 
I wanted to know more about the developmental process. So you started with over 200 drawings and then did you get funding to, you talked about a director and other artists that were involved, so that was funding that paid for that? Yeah, so when you make a show, or, um, you can apply for what they call a developmental funding. So you, you can say, I want to experiment, I want to try, this is stage one, this is what I want to try. And I want to make art about my experience growing up, my family. I want one or two weeks at a venue, and you need to find a venue, and you need to get confirmation from that venue that will host you. Uh, how much the venue is and get all costs of lighting and stage. And sometimes the venue will say, we'll give it to you for free. So you're then able to... Um, you're able to put a monetary value towards what the venue would be worth. So maybe you say, look, I want to experiment in dance um, or have a pink set or... Um, so you develop a budget. You get the letters um, of confirmation from the artists, you get biographies from the artists, you put that in, but you need to explain why, what's the vision, what's the purpose, who's the audience, who's going to love this, who's going to benefit, so that all needs to go in the application, you need to also put the budget in, and then submit, and say you win the money, well done. You need to pay all those people and make sure all the costs are covered, that you've got super work cover, all those things covered, insurance. And you can have an agency that works with you. So you give them 5% and then they will make sure that you're safe, that the all the policies and legal aspects have been met. Then you invite industry to watch a show. Maybe you show about only half an hour, so not the full show. So you invite all the fancy people. Um, and they come along and they watch and they say, oh, yes, I'd like to see you develop the next stage of this show. We will support you. So you find a support and partnerships. Then you move to the next stage. You edit, you make a great video, you share, you market. You get lots of audience support. And then towards the end of the second development stage, you ask for more funding. You wait, potentially three months. Then they approve you for more funding, which is great. And then you do a premiere event. So you pay the team to get back together, the venue, the lighting, uh, and that needs to be spot on. The budget and everything needs to be spot on. The audience needs to be right. And then if it's successful, if you get picked up by the papers or a festival, they buy the shows and that's where you can get started. So there's like a market you can, uh, you know, pitch to an audience and they can buy your show. So sell it, so to speak. Yeah, you sell the show and you make connections and networks and you know, you sh change cards, you shake hands and it's a bit of a yawn to be honest. Um, you put a big smiley face on, there's champagne <laughs> and all the fancy things. Uh, then you network, you, intru you get introduced to lots of different people. Uh, but of course I'm happy to share anything you want. That's really the game. So from the 200 drawings, did from that you created a script. And how did you edit the script? Did you have to create a series of drafts? Was there a developmental process? Did it take a number of weeks? How did that work? So six years. <laughs> right, okay, six years, so quite a long time, right. Within the six years, uh, the drawings maybe a year. The drawings for me are is my Auslan. It's my visual language. So that was my layout. I applied for the residential um, retreat and I showed my drawings and I said, I want to write a story that fits with these pictures. They gave me $1,000, a car and a house for two weeks. They covered my food and a little bit of income. And that was down in Albury. And so I'd spend the days writing, spend the nights, freaked out. Uh, it was terrifying. <laughs> and then I would share that work with artists. But I'm, honestly, I'm not a great writer. I can't write a script. But I was able to then share it with the sound directors, the designers, the videographers. 
a director? Did you have a director? Yes, I did, a director. That was right at the end. Uh, at first, I did all the groundwork with the team, the creative team, and we realised, <laughs> oh, we might need a director, and we brought them in at the end. The writing helped the sound people. They It helped the set design. It helped them respond to my writing. And then we had to edit, of course, cut it all down, mix it up, add some signs. It really, it was a collaboration. I didn't hand a perfect script and say, I have an idea, it's going to cover this, this and this. It was more of a, this is what I've got, it's a starting point. Then we discussed and we brainstormed, we shared ideas, visual, sound, and most of the script we mostly got rid of. So we looked at visual language and sound language, film language, my signing is in my Auslan, my body movement, my performance, and then So I'm interested to ask you in terms of your drawings. You said you had 200 pieces of artwork to tell your story. <laughs> I'm wondering, are you planning to make that a part of your exhibition? <laughs> and look, I, I ask because for me, I think it's actually quite interesting. I'm wondering if you're willing to share those pictures at a later date or whether there's something that you're going to just hold off. My drawings are really terrible, Alex. Really bad. It's not my strength at all. Look, honestly, I don't know. Maybe, maybe if the show uh, tours, um, you know, in the foyer, maybe we could show those. But I'd look at need to buy frames and the rest of it and cart them around Australia. You need to apply for that. Mm, make an application, ah, perhaps. Very true, Alex. Very true. Um, I think I don't know if they're going to give me money for frames, to be honest. I don't think they're going to fund frames. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Just checking in terms of time. I believe the time is half past seven. And unfortunately, we had <coughs> time just for that last, that one and only question. Unfortunately, they've yeah. said, if someone does have one very quick question that they'd like to ask, they can come and take the floor. Is there anyone? Wow. So what's next for you, Joni? Hmm. Uh, just between us. <laughs> oh, gosh, there's a camera. Maybe not between us. Uh, cut, cut, <laughs> cut the camera. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, Would you like me to film and put it on Twitter? Uh, this week, uh, last night, a couple of nights ago, I applied to applications. Worked very hard on both of them. I applied for a fellowship, to two fellowships, which really means uh, to have access to grant a grant for two years, so I don't have to focus on working and interpreting, but it's a steady income for two years to do some research. I really want to focus on my next project and work out what, you know, the next uh, phase of my life looks like, what the, the year 2080 looks like or, you know, the, the year 3000, what does that look like? What does the future of disability look like? What does the future of the deaf community look like? The future of sign language? It's something I really want to spend time, you know, really looking into. And do you want to be alive at that time? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will be, Alex. <laughs> you know, with all the nips and tucks I've got coming. I'm interested now because the deaf community is getting smaller. The deaf children are... You know, the community is getting smaller. The signing of Oz, uh, the future of Auslan. I wonder what that looks like with the intervention of technology, of genetics. People that have uh, babies that have sound, uh, Down syndrome, there's been tests, uh, a test now to be developed that you can identify that before the baby's even born. I have a lot of fears. Because what happens to our diversity? Who makes those decisions? Science? The medical profession? I'm asking you. That's, that's not what I want to see. So I really want to ask people, well, people with a disability, to I want to collaborate with the disability community and ask them what they think about that. 
and where you all fit in terms of the fight for the future. Do you want to be part of the future? So it's something I'm looking into. I want to spend two years interviewing the community, doing some research, um, and I want to work with the futurists. It's their job to predict the future. So they're called futurists. They're uh, experienced in artificial intelligence, robots, oh, so many different things, food of the future, cars, the, you know, the driverless cars. I want to collaborate with them and include their perspective. Is there inclusion in the future? I want to talk about that. So that's my next step, my next bit of research. <laughs> Is that okay with everybody? It's very, <laughs> it's I'm very heavy. I'm excited already. But I feel that's going to stir the pot even further. Absolutely. I'll be very excited to see that work in the future. Jody Mundy, thank you very much. It's been an absolute honour to sit here and have this chat with you. I'm Likewise. sure I have so many more questions I would love to ask you, but of course, time has beaten me at this stage. Thank you very much, and thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. Please enjoy your night, and I will pass it over to Riona to close the evening. Wow. Wow, I've got goosebumps. I'm a bit sad that it's all ending, but um, I've seen the performance, and... Uh, had a chat with Jody. You really need to see the performance on s tomorrow night and Saturday night. It's worth the money, worth going along, and it's worth Jody's income. <laughs> we want to give we want to give her food on the table. We just want we don't want to be a struggling actress. Yes, yes, I'm starving. <laughs> and look, this isn't real. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> so people that are artists, performers, writers. Accessible arts, we help them with applications. We help them with um, Auslan videos if you want to apply. Um, we, can give you, we can give you the support you need. Um, myself and my team, obviously, when I'm not in the office, I've got a team of people who, who are on hand to help. So if you've got a passion and you need to you follow it, I know we all work other jobs. Some of you work, at, like work for Uber, just to support your passion. You know, I worked as a support worker. So I need to make sure that I have another I have income to support my passion. There was no money in art. So, you know, Jodie's really reflected us with us the same story tonight. And I feel like I can really um, uh, agree with Jodie's story. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. I hope you all enjoyed it. A big thank you to Jodie and Alex. Uh, it's been a great night. Thank you. So well done, Jodie. Thank you.